And welcome into another edition of the Gamecock Central Radio Podcast. I'm Wes Mitchell alongside Chris Clark with a special Q&A edition of the Gamecock Central Radio Podcast. we got some questions from uh, social media, got some questions from the Insider Forum, which is of course our main sort of hub there on Gamecock Central for all of our subscribers as we start to sort of turn the page to NC State here soon. Got some interesting questions for our members. Um, Chris, uh, l- looking forward to sort of looking ahead to NC State and starting to get to that point of the schedule. Um, I-, I thought, you know, as far as this week, um, the most interesting thing to me since the last time we hopped on was sort of uh, Mike Peterson and-, and his confidence level in uh, the-, the buck position. You know, th- this is a guy that, you know, I, I personally think is a is a bit of a rising star in coaching. You hear a lot of positive things about him out there. Um, you know, very impressive what he did with Darius English last year. And, um, you know, diff- different coaches sort of take different approaches to the media. Some of them are just always positive guys. Other, you know, some of them more even kill. I don't know if we have a great feel in general for what type of guy Mike Pearson is, but um, he, he made no bones about the fact that he seems – uh, very excited and uh, and and very happy with the play of his Bucks so far. So I, I think when you consider the fact that the pass rush has been a concern, uh, that that's got to be a, a pretty good early sign for the Gamecocks as far as Mike Peterson's comments on the uh, on the Buck position uh, following I, I guess practice on Thursday. Yeah, and, and like you said, he coached Darius English to to his uh, you know his best season by far as a Gamecock sack leader on the team, and I think really squeezed more out of that spot than people were anticipating. Now that is the main pass rush spot in Muschamp's defense; it's one that they really rely on um, to create pass rush, so that helps schematically. But Peterson did a good job with him. We've, as you said, we've heard a lot of good returns on him from you know folks in the coaching industry, folks in the program, and you know. They lose him, uh, but having DJ Wanham back, who looks a lot different than last season physically, um, and, and you know has drawn a lot of good reviews this off season. Moving Bryce and Allen Williams out there, even if it's just part time, to give him something there. Brad Johnson, who you know has has put more weight on as a true freshman and has a chance to factor in. They even you know talked about Daniel Fennel um, as well in that spot so he does seem to to feel pretty good about it feels like maybe they have a little bit more depth than than maybe we anticipated going into the season there and that's going to be a key because you know generating pass rush is going to be something they need to improve on this season yeah and you know i I think that's something we've seen um with this staff um to me seems to be a bit of a uh strength of theirs is that uh, i think they're very good at at managing this roster uh you know I, i think uh, when I say that, I mean the ability to maximize sort of what um, what you're going to get out of a particular position. And, you know, you have to do it in multiple ways a lot of times because they're not at the point yet where they're just able to recruit, um, you know, a bunch of four and five stars and bring them in and, and they play and it's good to go. But I, I think taking a guy like Bryce Down Williams, I, I think one of the biggest questions um, for this team just as far as, curiosity for me is how exactly is Bryson Allen Williams used you know I think that um, we, we looked at uh, you know if you look at what Peterson said on Thursday um, he, he kind of left it out there he said he said we're not going to give it away um, I, I've I've got you know there's a plan in place he's going to be on the field so you know I think with with what he brings to the table and his veteran leadership his ability off the edge I think um, it goes back to something else Peterson said, and that is that it's all about down and distance. It's all about situational um, substitutions, basically. So I I think what we're going to see is depending on the matchup, depending on the down and distance, um, you know, depending on the game situation, you know, we're going to see Bryce and Allen Williams, I think, lined up um, the way I count it, probably three different positions because he's at the Sam when they're in the traditional 4-3. He does have his time at the Buck, and we've seen him work a ton at the Buck, you know, in, in the little bit of time we've seen, at least with that position group. And then 
you know, I, I think probably at the mic some when they're in the nickel and Wanham is, is at the buck in that in that package. So uh, I think what we're going to see is them basically try to, uh, you know, use Bryce and Allen Williams' skill set um, to the absolute max um, and sort of try to take advantage of the fact they've got a senior guy who, who knows this defense very, very well at this point. Yeah, it's almost like uh, Debo Samuel on offense where Muschamp said we're going to get the ball in his hands as many ways as we can, whether it's in the slot or out wide or um, using him as a as a basically a de facto running back. We saw that some last season on the jet sweeps where you're just letting him carry the ball and go. Sort of in that same vein, they're going to use one of their best players on defense, one of their most versatile guys, and Bryson Allen Williams are going to line him up. Now he's not going to be catching the ball, obviously, but you know you let him go pass rush, you let him cover. Uh, let him help stop the run, and, and you put him in some different situations. And I think one thing to remember when we're talking about how he's utilized is USC still razor thin at linebacker, at the traditional linebacker spot. So they'll have to be careful with how they manage him in terms of where they're slotting him. Um, but that's the case with everybody at linebacker and, and really at other positions too just because of the depth on this team. Yes, yeah, so it'll be it'll be interesting to see how they manage all those things. Um, I, I think the – the thing that stands out to me as well is that they seem to have a plan in place for all the scenarios, which um, obviously is important because it's, it's as much champ likes to say a lot. It's not about who necessarily is the next guy up. It's about who is the best guy up. What, what puts your best 11 on the field? Uh, situationally, um, you know, that the best 11 for one situation may not necessarily be the best 11 for, uh, you know, a, a separate situation. So, uh, so all, all those things will be pretty interesting to watch. All right, let's let's hit. We're going to do our questions thread. I think we'll maybe do these periodically. Um, I always like to try to keep it as interactive as possible. And um, we're going to start uh, right at the top there on the Insiders Forum with uh, with USC Beckham, who is of course our uh, moderator there on TIF that does an outstanding job. Actually, writes for us as well and helps with our social media. Um, really does a ton behind the scenes for Gamecock Central. So I thought fitting to start with him and fitting with what we're talking about right now, Chris, um, over under for sacks by a South Carolina defense, by this South Carolina defense. Uh, now, admittedly, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm not a uh, huge stat guy. So a lot of times when people ask me stat questions, I have to go look up a sort of uh, like give myself a window you know what I mean like I I know some people in this business are really big into stats I'm you know more into eyeball and stuff like that but um, so I went to give myself a range right well last year the sack leader in the SEC is uh, no surprise Alabama um the worst team, and they, they had 54 sacks, which was 15 more than Texas A&M, who was second. With uh, Miles and Garrett and Deshaun and, Hall on their team. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, ten, and Tennessee uh, is, is fifth with 30. Um, and they obviously had some studs on their front. Uh, Vanderbilt is last last year with 15. South Carolina checks in with a eleventh in the conference with twenty one. Yeah. So I personally don't think you see that number take a massive jump into twenty nine to thirty to thirty one territory, which puts you fourth, fifth, or sixth. But I'm looking at Arkansas and Auburn with twenty five sacks at eighth. Missouri with 27 sacks at 7th. I think that is sort of the upper level of possibility right there. If if things go well, if they stay healthy, I I think it would be a big positive if they could just jump maybe four or five sacks on the year and get up into that mid-20s level versus lower 20s do you you think that's realistic I I think it's there's not going to be maybe one guy that gets nine sacks like Darius English but I think it would have to be a team thing Um, you know maybe you get a little bit better secondary play that forces 
Uh, quarterbacks to hold on a bit longer. Maybe you get a few more sacks from the linebacker position with a little more. I think you have more athleticism at the linebacker position. Um, I think as a whole, as a team, uh, 25 would be a great step forward. Yeah, it would, and I'm glad you gave that range. Somebody asked me that a similar question several days ago on Insiders Forum about the number of sacks, and you know, I went back and looked. They saw they had 21 last season. I said, you know, if they could make that jump up to you know 30, that'd be great. And, and I, su- I suppose it's possible. But after sort of hearing your range, I'm glad you gave that. I mean, it is tough to make that substantial a jump and get up into there. I mean, you're talking about a Tennessee team, for example, who had you know Derek Barnett out wide and he's you know causing havoc all over the place certainly gave south carolina fits over the years and so um that would be a tough number to get to and so if they can add five or six that total would be positive but you know i also think look any coach is happy is going to be happy when his his team gets a sack on defense but i think just as important as just pressuring the quarterback affecting the quarterback you know making him make bad throws getting in his face hitting him that's going to be just as important as an actual sack. You like sacks. They, they make the other team lose a down, and, and they make them lose some distance as well, and they put them in some difficult situations. But just getting more pressure in general is also going to be a key. I remember Nick Saban a while back, early in his tenure, I think in Alabama, was asked about you know sacks because they had had trouble you know compiling statistical sacks. And he said, look, when I was in the NFL, there wasn't a single stat that we had that, that sort of measured the impact of, of sacks. And now I'm sure they do have that nowadays with the analytics and all that stuff. But what he was saying was affecting the quarterback was the most important thing. So I'm not downplaying the importance of it. Um, but I think if there's just more pressure on the quarterback, that'd be a positive too. But but I'm with you. If they could get up to 25, 26, that'd be a positive. And on the flip side, they gave up 41 on offense last season. So that ratio is is really out of whack and something they're going to have to try to improve on. Yeah, yeah, and and, and like I said, I'm, I'm not a huge stat guy either, but that, that at least gives you a little bit of a, just a, a – I think stats are great to sort of give you uh, a comparison maybe to mm-hmm. um, – to the other teams in the conference and stuff like that. Although sometimes stats are used as like a, you know, the end all of um, arguments, and I, I don't really agree with them to that to that extent. But um, okay, let's move on to another one. Uh, we got uh, Scar fan in Bama who uh, wants to know: Assuming Montac fully recovers and no further injuries, pick your starting five defensive backs at the midpoint of the season. Um, you know, I, I think that the starting five right now uh, appears to me to be pretty clear. You know, I, I think you're going to have DJ Smith there at safety. I think you're going to have Chris Lamonts at safety. I think you have Rashad Fenton and Jamarcus King on the outside at cornerback. And then you're going to have Jamias Williams uh, sort of there in the slot at the nickel spot. I, I think that's their best five guys. Um, you know, prior to the injury to Jalen Dickerson, I would have given him a solid chance of maybe working into that mix at safety and taking somebody's spot. Um, you know, but I I think that's pretty – Chris, I think that's pretty clearly their best five guys. You know, he specified the midway point of the year. Um, I, I think Steven Montak is that going to be that sort of versatile guy that just gives you um, – he's sort of your Swiss Army knife. He can play any position. Um, you know, he's maybe the next guy up at a number of positions, and, and, and it's great to have a guy like that. I think that helps your overall um, just defense as a whole. It, it helps your whole team, I think, to have a guy like that. Uh, the, the one person I would maybe look at is, would be maybe a Keyson Nixon Um possibly sliding into mix you know somewhere but um but like i said i, I think those are the, the best five to start the year and you know pro- probably i would think remains that way uh, what, what do you think yeah i mean mid midpoint is a key car- part of the question because that gives some of these younger guys who maybe they're not ready at the beginning of the year they gain some valuable experience so certainly you would point to a jamias williams being in the mix and, and Keyshawn nixon as well um you know, for me, I think, and this isn't answering the question directly, I think we could see Stephen Montak being the game one starter, say, at nickel or safety. Um, 
maybe more inclined to think that USC plays him at nickel. The reason I say that is that, you know, NC State, they're, they're going to run the ball. They'll give some different looks. Montac has more experience. He's played nickel last season. I could see him being the game one starter over Jemias Williams. And also Montac's going to be at that point, at this juncture in his career, he's going to be a more physical player. He's going to be more solid, in my opinion, against the run. And so I think that's, you know, when then I look to midpoint of the season and I say, okay, you know, who could it be then? I think Williams as a freshman could be, could be more of a situational nickel. Okay. When you're playing a Texas A&M or a Clemson, for example, um, you're anticipating pass, you get him out there for his coverage skills, his ability to run, his ability to play in space. And Montax more of your guy who, like you said, he's a versatile guy. He can play any of the five spots on the field if they needed him to. Um, but I think he's a guy who's got experience and maybe is more physical and is maybe better against the run. And that's something this staff looks at. They, they really place a premium on being able to get in there and get physical with guys. So that's why I really – I wouldn't rule out Montac even at the midpoint of the season. And it could change um, based on the game situationally. Um, th- they could – heck, I mean, one team could send out – um, a certain personnel group that causes them to send out one player over the other. I, I think both are going to play. I think Keyshawn Nixon's going to play. And and to some degree, how much he gets in will be dictated by, you know, are they healthy? And, um, you know, is DJ Smith playing well? Is Chris Lamont's playing well out at safety? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think um, I think with, my, with Montag, it's just also about getting him healthy. You know, at, at sure. what point um, – you know, at what point do you sort of have to start to? Because I, I know Muschamp said last Saturday they reevaluate him in ten days, and you know we'll, we'll see where he is at that point and if he's able to go the you know in the opener. At at some point you start getting so close to that opener that um, you know he he's maybe not available, and and then you're just I, I think if my attack is not available, then your your starting five is pretty set. I, I think I think Jemias Williams probably is the guy. Just. Uh, you know, and it's not necessarily always fair or great to throw a freshman out there game one, but um, you know that that may just be the situation they're in. And I, you know what? I I think you still possibly see some, maybe even some Antoine Wilder. Um, you know, what, what he's doing right now at the Sam is really not that much different than um, you know playing the nickel, which he played a lot of last year as well. So. Uh, you know, you could you could still see that as well. You know, you look at Chris Moody last year; they moved him to one of the linebacker spots, and then just didn't have the depth in the secondary to sort of keep it there. And and he ended up playing, you know, safety again at the end of the year. So you know, and I, I think at the end of the day, that the important thing about this defense, Chris, is that I I think they have across the board. It's not perfect. It's not where they want it to be. But they have more athleticism and more depth than they did last year. Um, their safeties are going to be able to run. That's something that was a struggle last year. Um, I think as a whole, that that's a big thing maybe that's not getting talked about enough is, is the increased um, experience and athleticism in this secondary. It is. And, and it's still not, like you said, not perfect because if they have a key injury or two, that could still – you know, really derail things. Linebacker, of course, is razor thin. They they really can't have any significant injuries to starters up front, period, in my opinion. Um, it, it would be very, very difficult. But that said, I mean, they, they were able to cobble it together at times last season with that secondary with guys that were inexperienced and playing in a first-year defense, you know, still learning on the go to a degree. Um, and we're still able to, you know, be opportunistic and turn in some solid performances at times. And, and so they got to just try to build off that. All right, let's move on to another question. Uh, we got Colorado Gamecock92 who uh, wants to know which player on defense that does not have the name Sky Moore has the best chance to end up on an all-SEC list at the end of the year. Um, I mean, I, th- I think uh, Bryce Nile Williams is probably the, the easy answer, the obvious answer. Um, if I were to give him a real just sleeper, um, sort of go go out there, you know, I would say maybe Rashad Fenton um, would be like a surprise. Like, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I could just see him surprising some people and having a really big year, um, you know, just based on some of his natural coverage abilities. And then, you know what, Taylor Stallworth, I, I think, is a guy that 
probably doesn't get the uh, maybe attention or accolades that he deserves, but you just look at the way the staff talks about him. Um, he's been injured you know, a bunch of times in his career, so that's maybe hurt his uh, development at times and hurt his stats at times. Um, you know, Stallworth probably doesn't necessarily – get the attention to be an all sec guy but i i could see that happening uh what do you think chris yeah uh you know didn't leave me a ton of options there but i i would say those guys are uh those guys are, are certainly one the one that came to mind to me and and if we're talking sec list i assume that doesn't mean colorado gamecock 92 isn't only talking about hey you got to be a first team all sec pick you know it could be second or they have a third right and then an honorable mention um, I would look at Chris Lamonts as being one. I mean, he he had a good season last year. He's a senior. Uh, last year, he did a lot of different things. I mean, you look at like in the East Carolina game, he had a sack, a forced fumble, um, an interception. I mean, just did a lot of good things. And so he's he may move around some. Um, he'll either play safety or nickel this year, but he can play corner. And if he does, he'd be their second best corner, uh, as Will Muschamp said. So he's a guy I could see sneaking onto one of those lists because. Um, you know, play in safety, he may have a chance to increase his production in terms of tackles. Um, it's, it's a key position in Muschamp's defense with how much activity there is. And um, he's a guy who's got some ball skills and can run. Um, he could also contribute on special teams as a returner or, or you know, d- going down and making tackles. So I think he's got a chance to, you know, put enough on the stat sheet potentially and show enough to be able to make one of those lists. Yeah, and Le- Lamont's is a guy you kind of pull for. He's a, you know, senior year, final final go around. Um, seems to have his mind in the right place for this. So, um, yeah, I think I think he's had a big camp so far. It'll be interesting to see how he uh, translates it to the field this year there at safety. Um, fitting question from Bagel 400. It fits right in with everything else we've said. Um, if Montac gets healthy, does Lamont's go back? to nickel um and i mean you, you sort of hit on that earlier not necessarily i mean uh Mon- montac could just play nickel but I, I think to the 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 point of that question and the point to what we're saying is is that you know when you have these versatile guys it, it just gives the staff a little bit uh more leeway to kind of uh be more matchup oriented you know at there were times last year where South Carolina just sort of had to put who was available and could perform on the field. Um, I think what you'll see with this staff as time goes on, they have a little bit more freedom to put um, the best matchups for their opponent on the field at any given time. Yeah, that's what it's all about. There's a lot of matchup ball and their hands are sort of tied at times last season, offensively and defensively, you know, when, when you look at things they could do, things they couldn't do. And so it's not where they want it to be because ideally they'd have, you know, a, a great pass rush up front and a ton of depth at linebacker and then the secondary and eight to ten guys they could rotate up front. They don't have that yet, but they do have a little more depth at certain spots, even if some of it's unproven. They've upgraded their ability to run, even though, you know, some of those guys we won't see – this season or we won't see as much of them as we will in the future um but th- those are important things and gives them you know i, I bet they can probably uh, sleep better at night in their game preparations than they did at times last season although certainly they're they're not satisfied where 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 things are at nor should they be they still got a lot of recruiting to do all right and our next question is from chris twenty thousand and eleven, and uh from arlington texas uh wow Okay, Chris, so uh, he wants to know what are our chances at two 1,000-yard receivers and a 1,000-yard rusher in the same year? Uh, You know, I'm going to go ahead and say I I think that the offense could be very, very good and then those numbers still not be possible. And, you know, you look at sort of the depth at receiver, you look at the depth at uh, tight end, you look at the depth at running back. Um, I I think ideally, you know, if if South Carolina is going to be really good on offense this year, Chris – they probably just want to spread the ball around versus maybe having, um, you know, one or two guys get all the accolades, I think. I'm with you. That's a good point on spreading it around. And, you know, you look back at 2014, that was a season in which USC had a really good offense. It was prolific in terms of passing with 3,500 passing yards from Dylan Thompson. And even then, 
the only one of those benchmarks they hit was a thousand yard receiver. Farrah Cooper had, I think, 1100 yards and he did it on 69 catches. I mean, he, he was all over the place and got the ball a ton. Um, and so I think really on paper, this team has a little more depth in terms of receiving options. And then that year, Mike Davis had almost a thousand yards, but USC will probably spread it around there a little bit more with Tyson Williams, Rico Dowdle, AJ Turner. So I'm with you. This could still be a good offense, but I'm, I'm inclined to think they may not hit even one of those marks in terms of even having maybe 1000 yard receiver. It's possible, uh, but I think it's more likely that it's spread around a little bit more. And that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. I, I think if, you know, you look at these spread offenses, I, I think the absolute bit, you know, you talk about balance a lot of times on offense, and generally you're talking about when people say balance, run versus pass. But in this case, I think balance would be spreading the ball to, to Debo Samuel, to Brian Edwards, to Hayden Hurst, to Tyson Williams, to Rico, to, you know, getting all those guys the ball and getting those guys the ball in space I think is the key to this offense. Uh, let's go on to – uh, bagel 400 um, from New York. Uh, we're going to hit one of your questions, Bagel. We already hit one of them per, for the most part. Uh, what's the latest on Skarnekia? What's the word behind the scenes? Um, obviously, he's not Bentley, um, but hopefully he's shown flashes of good passing ability is what Bagel says. He also says also his legs are supposed to be pretty good, correct? Um, now, if you're, if you see Skarnacki, you're not going to be talking about his legs. So you may be confusing him a bit with Jay Urich. Uh, you know, Jay's a little bit more your athletic type of quarterback. You know, sort of a four six forty guy, big kid that can run and throw a little bit. Just has to develop, I think, as a passer. Um, Skarnacki, uh, you know, I, I guess there hasn't been a ton said about him. Uh, what, what have you heard about him, Chris? I, I mean, I, I think it's one of those things where, you know, you'd have to. They would be asking him to manage the game, I think, if he were to have to go in there. You know, you know, like I, I know <laughs> that term "game manager" is like a, what would you say, a pseudo insult to to quarterbacks at, at times. But, uh, but I mean, that that's that's the way. That's just what it would be. <laughs> no, I was going to bring up game manager if you didn't, and um, you know, it it would certainly change the complexion of things if he's playing. Um, the thing to remember is is, is even regardless of what we hear he's a guy that's unproven and and he's going into he's been around the program for quite a while but you got to remember he's thrown one career pass and he's thrown no passes in a game in this offense and so uh, he also missed a lot of practice reps last year because he was out for the season so he's still inexperienced even though he's been around on campus in columbia for quite a while and jay Urich, obviously like you said is still inexperienced uh, he hadn't played at all, and he's still developing. Um, you know, both those guys got a good many snaps in the last scrimmage. Um, I've heard that, you know, it, it has overall been positive in terms of both have performed well in those scenarios they've been placed in. I think Yurik's come along maybe a little bit faster than people have anticipated. Skarnecki has done a good job of, you know, just, just doing taking care of the ball, getting rid of it on time, which is a point of emphasis. Um it, 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 would it be ideal if either of them were in a football game this season? I don't think so. Um, but I, I do think they've, they've liked what they've seen from them in their particular roles. Uh, Skarnecki would be the first guy out there. And like I said, it, it would change how they run the offense. I think it would probably change how they call some plays, probably lean on the run more even. Um, but, but he's a guy that if you put him in there, I think maybe you feel better about it at this point than you did, say, before the season, but but still a, a really mm-hmm. big concern in terms of depth. GTC, I think we can hit this one pretty quick. Who would be our best slot receiver by midseason? Uh, Shai Smith, I think pretty easy answer. Agreement? Yeah, uh, Casey Crosby, you know, will play in the slot, but Shai Smith in terms of a true receiver, almost a no-doubter for me. Yeah, uh, same guy, uh, similar question. Which freshman, redshirt or true freshman, on offense and defense could potentially be a breakout player this year and why? Um, Chris, you want want to hit that one? I'll pick – I'd take Shai Smith on offense um, just because I think he actually has a good chance of starting game one. That doesn't mean he's going to put up – astronomical numbers by any means but if you if you start for an sec team you know as a true freshman you're doing something right and there's been a lot of positive returns so um i'd, I'd pick him offensively um 
defensively, you know, you could go a lot of different directions with that. Um, you know, you might could pick Jamias Williams because he's going to play a lot. Uh, I think you could go with an Aaron Sterling um, at the defensive end, maybe Rad Johnson at Buck. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I, I'm starting to lean a little bit more towards, uh, you know, an Aaron Sterling potentially being a guy as the year goes on that maybe plays a little bit more. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I, and I would have said Brad Johnson, but I, I think Bryce Allen Williams, is he, with, if he is healthy, him playing some more at the buck uh, sort of helps a little bit to, uh, you know, to keep them from having to just throw Brad Johnson out there. Uh, right off the bat, which it seemed like was going to be the case, um, and, and then you know Jamias is going to be on the field. So I mean, I, I like all those guesses. I you know, and I, I even think uh, Taven Jackson is a guy who's probably uh, doesn't fit the term breakout, but will will be a solid sort of um, you know role, role guy that that steps in and, and plays well when he's needed. And if there's an injury or two, then all of a sudden uh, Taven Jackson may may be a starter. So uh, I think that. Uh, I think he's a guy that this staff is very, very high on for the future. So, um, but those are, I mean, th- those are your your obvious ones. And, and then shoot, man, Sherrod Green, um, not going to be a starter, but uh, the kid's going to play a lot. I think, um, you know, in a backup role. So uh, he, he's got a bright, bright future in this program as well. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, uh, Wyo Gamecock. Um, says, uh, say Biff is skimming through the Sports Almanac and it tells you the Gamecocks will go either 9-3 and three or 3-9. Three and nine. Which is correct? Which do you pick and why? Um, I don't think they win nine games and I don't think they win only three games. If you made me pick one, I'd maybe say the nine wins. Um, uh, I just I can't see this team only winning three games. I think nine wins is going to be tough, but it, to to fit your question, I, I would go. I would say nine and three. I guess. I think this team. You know, I, I'm with you, Wes. I don't know that I see either one of those scenarios happening. However, I, you know what? I'm just going to play devil's advocate. Are you picking nine wins? I I would say if you look back, you you could see how. If the wheels came off, you could look back and say that, oh, man, things really unraveled and they won three games. Um, I maybe, think maybe an injury to Jake Bentley? Yes, an injury to Jake Bentley. Look, the schedule's difficult anyway. If every mm-hmm. single player is healthy, I mean, they could lose it to NC State in game one. Missouri is not going to be an easy game because they're going to test you with how they run their offense. Barry Odom's a good defensive mind. It's on the road. It's not an easy place to play. You know, Kentucky has just – riddled South Carolina for a while now. I think they'll win that game this year finally. Um, you got to go at A&M. Arkansas is going to have a huge offensive line. They're going to run the ball a ton. At Tennessee is a tough game. Um, you know, you got to go to Georgia. You play Florida, who will be better on offense. You got to play an option team in Wofford, and then you got to play Clemson. I mean, you, you look at those, and I mean, do you see a bunch of guaranteed wins? No. And so if there were some key injuries, even if there's not, you know, there's there's some losses built into there, and, and if they and if this team had a bad string of injuries, just didn't play well, just had a game or two where they turned the ball over a bunch, things just didn't go their way. You know, you could see three wins. I don't think it's likely, and I don't think you could put nine in that likely category either. Right, right. Good, good question though. I, I like that. I like that. Um, made us think. Uh, let's see, James Rob, who leads the team in sacks. Um, Actually, I think Bryce Allen Williams. Yeah. I, I, that, yeah, that would have been my second pick, I think. Um, uh, what are you hearing on, on MJ Webb? Does he end up seeing the field a lot this year? I, I think MJ, just the impression I get probably a year away, uh, that, that doesn't mean anything bad by any means. I, I just think, uh, you know, more of a – he was a guy who played on the edge some in high school, I think, and is growing into a true defensive tackle. Um, you know, I, I think that's just a matter of him getting getting stronger, getting used to college and, and stuff like that. So I, I think he'll probably get a year to sort of get to that point, but doesn't really mean anything. Still a true freshman. Uh, let's move on. Um, Red Fox won. Um, I, I thought this was one of the more interesting questions, Chris. Please discuss the biggest difference you see between the last two 
August under Spurrier and the first two Muschamp August, basically uh, preseason camp under Spurrier, preseason camp under Muschamp, uh, player development, strength and conditioning, coaching style. Um, I mean, I think the easy cop-out answer is just a focus on physicality. Um, but uh, like I said earlier, Chris, I, I think a, another big part of this has just been the way this staff manages the roster and has max, be it you know cross-training defensive backs, uh, moving a guy like Bryson Allen Williams around, um, you know, sort of making that move to getting Casey Crosby in the slot. It, it it's it's easy to forget, you know, Casey Crosby was a guy who was barely playing under Steve Spurrier, uh, who goes to to basically their their starting slot guy uh, last year under Muschamp. Um, you know, as sort of a two tight end set, but at the same time, you're basically using Crosby as as a wide receiver in the slot. So, I, I think the max maximization of the talent on the roster um you know at at multiple positions the physicality and just the attention to detail uh you know mapping things out as opposed to sort of flying at the seat of your pants um you know the the different uh, i guess technology they have now where they can track every single player and monitoring a guy like Debo's uh literally the amount of plays he runs in practice and the amount of Uh, miles he runs in practice so that you don't possibly get him injured again just I I think it's almost like and it it seems like I'm going to contradict myself Chris but in some ways this staff is very old school um, in that they want physical tough-nosed football players um, you know take no crap type mindset but then they've also brought the program as far as all the stuff surrounding the players into modern day uh, versus where it was previously. You know, for, for me, when you look at preseason, I mean, uh, you look at – I even go back to, you know, camps and just how they run prospect camps, how much more organized it is. The support staff is so much bigger. The recruiting staff is bigger. Um the player development, they got more tools at their disposal for that. There's a lot more accountability in the program um, with just the expectations. You know, it's not as loosey-goosey. Obviously, Spurrier had a lot of success during his career doing things his way, but there's there's a certainly an argument to being made to be made, and I don't think as much of an argument that that certain things need to be modernized around the program, and I think they've done that. You know, the physicality, that the pace of practice, the intensity, and the tempo is way different. Uh, that's one of the most glaring things. The media access is different. Um, of course, we don't we don't see as much in preseason, and and really that's fine. I'm not one of those guys that that really um, cares too much about that. I'd like to see a little bit more if we can, um, but but that's the difference. But I, I think the intensity with everything um, is a is a huge um, I think just a position to where it was before, and, and just you know head coach uh, total head coach involvement in all those things you mentioned. Um, I, I think puts it over the top for me. Uh, okay, final question here before we move along. Uh, Sir Spur, uh, one two two one six from Lexington, South Carolina. Uh, where do you see South Carolina in terms of total defense in comparison to last season? And he makes he points out that South Carolina was near the bottom of the league in sacks, but very opportunistic with turnovers. Um, and, and as has been a big sort of focus from the media this week has been South Carolina's focus on turnovers, uh, you know, the turnover bucket and doing dunks and stuff like that. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I think it's a hard question to answer. And I, I think at times, Chris, last year, the defense was made, you know, it, it was smoke and mirrors. Let's be honest, at times last year they were made to look better than they were because they were so opportunistic. Uh, you know, I think turnovers are sort of that great equalizer. If you get turnovers, you can give up a lot of yards in between the hashes. You can uh, give up some, some gash plays. But if you if you get turnovers, then you're still able to limit teams. And that that's what they were able to do last year. Um, ultimately, that can catch up to you when the turnovers don't come, you know. So I, I – I, I kind of honestly go back and forth when I start thinking about this defense and, and this year and what they're going to be capable of. Now, I, I do think, like I said earlier in the show, athleticism, you know, getting a guy like LeMans to safety, 
uh, you know, sort of upgrades the athleticism there. Getting Sky Moore back at linebacker sort of upgrades the athleticism there. Um, they're going to be more athletic in some spots. That that will help them, obviously. Um, when all is said and done, um, how how improved is this defense? And I, I, you know what, this is a good time to point out. You had an article this week, Chris, where you sort of so you're probably much more equipped to answer this one than I am about sort of the improvement from year one to year two at at Muschamp's previous stops um, as a coach. Yeah, and and what I found out in looking at that was he – and this is something – I mean, it may be a common trend among all coaches, but I was just studying Muschamp's background. And so, you know, at, at Auburn, um, at LSU, at Florida as a head coach, um, and at Texas, you know, his defense showed improvement every year statistically from year one to year two. The, there was one year at Auburn where statistically they were better in scoring defense – and total defense in year one from a points and yards standpoint. But in terms of the statistical ranking, they were actually better. So that just meant scoring was up a little more in college football. Um, and, you know, one year, they had, LSU under Nick Saban and Muschamp, they had the number one defense in the country in scoring defense and total defense. And that was in, in the second year. And so it figures that there's going to be some type of improvement. For me, it's a hard question to answer in terms of how much, because I think a lot of it ties back to how healthy they are. Now, you could say that about a lot of teams, but this team is not as equipped as some other ones from a depth standpoint to survive a significant loss or two or three on defense. Any team that has injuries to starters is going to be affected, but some can overcome it better. So that's a big factor to me. And I think you made a good point where you're talking about scoring defense versus total defense. They were opportunistic last year, and so they finished – 51st nationally in scoring defense 26 and a half points a game there's 66 in total defense they gave up 411 yards a game so they were a little bit better i mean look at the east carolina game it gave up a ton of yards not a lot of points because they got a bunch of turnovers so um you want to be that opportunistic at the same time you can't count on being that opportunistic all the time so i do think they'll be better in some categories i don't think we can expect them to jump maybe, you know, into the top 25 in either of those categories. But making a marginal jump of some point, as long as they can stay healthy, I, I think that's fair. Yeah, and I, I think that um, the the different matchups, a little bit different schedule and stuff like that, that, that plays into the numbers as well. And like you said, injuries and, and sort of how, uh, how South Carolina sort of starts the year and, and – when these backups play that have never played before, I think we all agree a lot of these guys have some talent, uh, but they've never played in front of seventy, eighty thousand people before either. So how how those guys respond is obviously going to be a big part of it. And I, I think this staff feels more comfortable uh, being a little more versatile defensively and doing some different things and showing some different looks, which will be you know a little bit different from last year as well. So um, it, it'll be fun. Uh, so this is our obviously recording here on Friday, Chris. On Saturday, it'll be the second scrimmage of the fall. We'll have, of course, complete post-scrimmage coverage on GamecockCentral.com when uh, Will Muschamp talks to the media. I um, want to encourage everyone listening who's not a subscriber to try our uh, free promotion we have going on right now, Free Until UT, which basically gives subscribers um, – access to the site until the Tennessee game with the code capital free U T. Uh, a lot of people have taken advantage of that. So if you're listening, give that a shot as well. I'm sure. You'll find something you like. And, um, then, Hey, Chris, it's NC state time, man. I, I think, uh, after that open practice on Monday, which of course we'll have complete coverage of as well. Then I, I think it's officially time to start looking ahead to NC state. It is the team will turn their focus to NC state. I think we will in terms of our coverage a little bit more too, which I'm excited about start previewing some of those matchups individually and with the two teams on offense and defense, taking a deeper dive into the roster. So, uh, it'll be a fun time. For Chris Clark, I'm Wes Mitchell. This has been the Gamecock Central Radio Podcast. We're out.